Okay, on to our last time machine port of call. The main thing I remember learning about Japan back in the Triassic era when I attended high school was that American Naval Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into Edo, that is Tokyo Harbor in 1853, pointed his guns at the Japanese shore and forced a closed kingdom to open itself up to global trade and influence. This left me with the impression, which I really can't blame on my history teacher, that Japan had been entirely closed off before the American Navy sailed in. But that's a little hard to reconcile with emissaries showing up from all over Asia to celebrate the opening of Japan's enormous Todaji Hall in 752, or a Korean artist designing the Great Buddha. By the way, the highly symmetrical pagoda design of this temple showed its strong Chinese influence. Japanese architecture was traditionally more intimate. It was also more organic and asymmetrical, and above all, it tended to be closely associated with natural surroundings. This was a building designed to show off, especially to the Tang Chinese uh, dynasty. So this beautiful temple is not one of your required works, but I wanted you to see what is probably what is a more typically Japanese Buddhist temple complex, and Phoenix Hall is probably the most famous temple to pure land Buddhism. You may recall that that's a version of Buddhism that promised its followers salvation in a Western paradise if they follow the teachings of the Amitabha Buddha. It is the most popular form of Buddhism today in Japan, in Korea, and among Asian Americans. It's not hard to see how the whole structure was designed to create an image of a celestial paradise. Two bronze phoenixes decorate the ends of the ridge poles and gave the temple its name. They were said to alight on kingdoms that were properly ruled. So here again, we see Buddhism used by the imperial family to encourage unity and support for the regime. Do you remember what the phoenix symbolizes in Chinese iconography? The empress or the yin force. And do you remember this weird 1980 work? It's the vision of pure land paradise, well, complete with anime elves. But note again that the Phoenix Temple is more asymmetrical and is related organically to its surroundings. This form of Japanese architecture uh, would strongly influence American architect Frank Lloyd Wright. Falling water on the bottom right will be one of our required works, but not till the spring. When the Tang Dynasty in China started disintegrating, Japan terminated relations with China in 894 and did enter one of its periods of isolation. The imperial court moved to Kyoto from Nara, and for almost four centuries, non-Buddhist Japanese art was mostly the art of a highly cultured and frankly rather decadent imperial court. There are some really remarkable parallels to the French court of Louis XIV, 15th, and 16th at Versailles in 17th and 18th century France, and I hope I remember to return to that theme when we get to Rococo art. This era produced one of the most important works of Japanese, and for that matter, world literature, Tales of a Genji. The novel, sort of novel, is full of intrigue, romance, seduction, and it was actually written by a Japanese noble woman. This illustration comes from that book, and it's typical of Han-era court painting. It is not a required work. Instead, our next required work comes from a period when this rarefied world fell apart. In the late 12th century, Japan disintegrated into civil war, and for the next 600 years, it was ruled by a military ruler, the shogun. Powerful lords, the daimyo, and their warrior, warrior elite, the famous samurai. During the first part of this military rule, Japan actually maintained close ties to the Asian world and even opened up to Jesuit missionaries and to Portuguese and Dutch traders. In around 1600, however, the Tokugawa dynasty slammed that door shut until Commodore Perry forced it open in 1848. But we're getting ahead of our story. This work dates from the first period of warrior rule, the Kamakura period. The upper required image isn't much help, is it? That's because the work is almost 23 feet long. It tells the story of a relatively minor event in Japanese history, a brief armed skirmish between two competing factions for control of the capital, still Kyoto, and of the emperor. This is a hand scroll, and it was painted 100 years after the events took place. 
For what it's worth, the faction that won this battle lost in the long run. Basically, as the scroll unfolds again from right to left, one group of warriors surrounds the palace, captures the sovereign, the emperor, places them in a cart, and then consigns the structure to flames. Although this is not the scene that the College Board chose as its required image, it's probably the most iconic scene of the scroll, the one you're most likely to see if you Google a night attack at Sancho Palace. We see the palace on fire, the sky filled with swirling lines and bright colors, dramatic use of contour. Now, the website I've listed here lets you move through the entire scroll from right to left with explanations. You can zoom in and out and focus on the details, including really cool depictions of Japanese weapons and armor, if you like that sort of thing. I do. It's a lot of fun, and of course, it's up on Moodle. Now, the night attack at San Joe Paulus is a very important example of the Yamato-e painting, which is a style of painting that was distinctively Japanese. It showed much less Chinese influence. During the shogunate, Yamato-e paintings mostly superseded the elegant, courtly paintings of the earlier period. They suited the warrior culture that produced and admired these works. Don't try frantically to write all of this down now. I'm going to run through the scroll quickly and then come back to these elements of style, illustrating them from the scroll. So here we see at the beginning of the scroll the emperor's cart. And now the same cart is being surrounded by warriors. The scroll, like the Bayou Tapestry, like Trajan's Column, uses the device of continuous narration to tell the complicated story of a battle. The repeated images, such as the cart and also heads, which were shown on warriors and then decapitated, they help us find where we are in the narrative and also establish a kind of pattern and rhythm. Here we see the attackers approach the palace with a captured emperor in tow. They storm the palace and set it on fire. The ladies of the court are crushed or burned. The battle continues outside the city walls. And here in our required image, a lone archer escapes from the burning palace with an equestrian Japanese commander behind him. So note that while the soldier is not carefully delineated, his armor and weapons are. And this tells you something about what the patrons cared about. This is another work that military historians love to study. Notice also that you can really barely make out the face. Uh, there's very little facial detail in contrast, again, with the detail about armors and weaponry, armor and weaponry. And here are some other characteristics of Yamato-e painting we see what is called a bird's eye perspective. In other words, these paintings are viewed from above. And by the way, this is typical of Japanese painting. We'll see it in the next work, which is much more of a nature or landscape painting. We see bold colors. We see defined contours, heavy use of line, which is something that ink lends itself to. We see shallow space, but overlapping is used to create some sense of depth. Uh, we also, by the way, see strong diagonal lines in action. So before I leave the samurai, let me show you one more narrative painting. Again, not a required work. This one is a six-panel scroll made of ink-painted silk. It's a very characteristic Japanese art form, even though it doesn't show up on our list. Uh, this screen shows the great battle that established the Tokugawa shogunate in around 1600. This, by the way, was the military leadership that would once again close Japan off to the world. So this painting actually tells you one of the reasons the Tokugawa clan won the battle. Any guesses? Well, maybe this close-up will help. Basically, the guys with those newfangled guns, which they purchased from the Portuguese, whom the Tokugawa shogunate would soon kick out of Japan, they beat the samurai who had swords. This, by the way, is another work that has a very cool website that lets you explore the details. I've stuck it up on Moodle. Now, the Tokugawa shogunate ruled Japan from 1603 until 1868. Again, don't memorize those dates. Just try to keep a general sense of the centuries in your timeline. Saying Tokugawa shogunate is probably going to be good enough. During this period, the power of the emperor... Um, 
uh, excuse me, in 1868, the power of the emperor was restored and Japan began its mad dash toward modernization. But during the years of the Tokugawa shogunate, the shogunate maintained a monopoly and strict control over foreign trade. Both of our last works were produced during this period, although the Great Wave shows how Japan's isolation was already breaking down by the 1830s. During the Tokugawa shogunate, also known as the Edo period, because Japan's new capital uh, had moved to Edo, or it is now Tokyo, during this period, the once despised merchant class enjoyed a rise in social and economic status. This new affluence, in turn, produced a new market for art. We're going to see the same thing happen in Europe with the rise of the middle class. It also helped give rise to a culture that was more attuned to the common man. Again, something we'll see in Europe. So you've just seen an example of Tokugawa warrior art, the screen painting of the Battle of Sekigahara. Another form of Yamato-e, or indigenous painting, evolved during this period. Its most famous artist was Ogaka Ogata Korin, and in fact, he gave his name to the school. Rin is the second syllable of his name. Pa means school. So how would you contrast the Rinpa school work above with the Yamato-e work shown below, or works shown below? Well, obviously, the subject matter is much less warlike. This artist, the artist above, focuses on themes from nature. The composition is also much much less crowded. It is simple and austere. If you've seen Japanese flower arrangements, you'll know that they are very simple, really deceptively simple, often just a single beautifully arranged blossom with maybe a twig. So here you see two paintings by Ogata Korin, our required work on the bottom and another folding screen of irises along a bridge on top. While the subject matter, again, is very different from Night Attack on Sanjo Palace, these Yamato 8 paintings do have some qualities in common. By the way, I'm talking about these paintings compared to the Night Attack on Sanjo Palace. So what do you think some of the common qualities of Yamato 8 paintings might be? Well, here again, we see that bird's eye viewpoint. These paintings also employ vibrant colors. That's actually why I included the painting on top. It's harder to tell with the Plum Blossoms painting since, as you read, the painting has faded considerably. We see strong repeated patterns that create a sense of rhythm and help organize our viewing. We see diagonal lines that add drama, even to subjects as still and calming as these. Another interesting way that the painter uh, of the bottom picture that Corin shows drama is by cutting off the painting. This is something we're going to see used frequently in Baroque era paintings, so stay tuned. But the Rimpa school tended to take its subjects from nature and the seasons, not from history. Plum and cherry blossoms hold special significance in Japanese culture. They herald the end of what in Japan is a long, cold winter. They symbolize the coming of spring, also rebirth and renewal. Koren developed a painting style that was more abstract and simplified than the compositions of his predecessors. He did employ vivid colors or ink monochrome on occasion. Often he used gold leaf background, which reminds you of what works of art? How about Byzantine? And we'll see this again, by the way, in the late 19th century. Stay tuned for Klimt. Korin came from a family of wealthy textile merchants, and he used his decorative and bold designs on textiles, on lacquerwares, and on ceramics as well. His work was published in pattern books and manuals, and in this way, he inspired many other craftsmen. So here are two examples of Korin patterns that were published in books. Note the simple shapes. The active brush strokes, the bright colors, the diagonal land, lines, the nature themes. I could really imagine an attribution question involving Corin. Uh, I mentioned that he uh, came from a textile family and designed ceramics and textiles. This is a kimono that he's said to have designed for the matron of the family who hosted him on visits to Edo, again, today's Tokyo. Do you remember the spare Zen Buddhist aesthetic of these gardens? This seems much closer in spirit to our plum blossom, so I could imagine the college board making that experience. Now, Corin was not a religious Buddhist painter. In fact, he was well known for wild living in the city. But the Zen Buddhist aesthetic did influence Japanese nature painting. 
So we've seen that some Yamato A painting paint, artists painted the military world with samurai. Others, such as the Rinpa school, captured the natural world and followed Zen Buddhist ideals of spare, simple design. But this rising merchant class that I mentioned and the samurai warriors who no longer had wars to fight also gathered in social clubs to mingle despite rules against breaching social class barriers to read and write poetry and to enjoy the service of services of courtesans and of the beautiful young female entertainers known as geisha. These ca- pursuits were captured in art of the so-called floating world, which harkens back in some ways to that earlier Heian uh, court painting, which had Chinese influences. These, however, were made with woodblock prints. They were enormously popular, and because they could be reproduced in multiple copies, they were surprisingly cheap. We're going to be talking more about print technology when we get to the Renaissance. So this is kind of a fast forward. Basically, a rising middle class couldn't afford elaborately painted silk screens, but they could afford reproductions made by artists who carved designs into wood blocks and then printed them with ink. This whole world of geishas, of courtesans, tea houses, and theater is fascinating, and we don't have time. But the video I've listed here has a very interesting segment on this geisha and courtesan culture. I've put the times up here, and of course, you can find it on Moodle. So our final work is a woodblock print whose artist was heavily influenced by these artistic renditions of the floating world and who also produced very popular woodblock prints. This is probably the most famous Japanese work in the West, and it remains an iconic image used constantly in marketing ads and cartoons. This one is one of my favorites. But now I face a dilemma, and it's not just that we're running out of time, although, of course, we are. Even though Hokusai never traveled outside of Japan and probably never met anyone who wasn't Japanese, he was nevertheless profoundly influenced by developments in European art, which were beginning to come into Japan. These included materials such as oil paint and the effects they produced, and also techniques such as linear perspective. His woodblock prints, in turn, would have a very profound influence on late 19th century painters, including the Impressionists. The trouble is, we're not there yet. So, I am going to return to this work at some length in the spring. For now, let's watch a very short video that simply describes what's happening in this scene. So I'm going to close by showing you a few more woodblocks from this series, the 36 Views of Mount Fuji, which, by the way, the artist created when he was quite elderly in order to get out of debt. They were very popular. I want you to think about, maybe talk about, the elements that these works have in common, particularly look at composition, line, color. And then, if you have time, uh, you can watch a video segment on the making of woodblock prints. Well, we'll come back to this work, I promise. For now, all that you have left is the test review podcast for this unit and a semester final. You get a well-deserved two-week break over Christmas unless you feel like writing a few extra credit essays. When we return, we will travel back to Europe and to the amazing world of the Italian Renaissance. So I suggest you rest up.